Welcome to my sci-fi review. Time travel. The future. Humans split into two separate races. What do you think of? What? Pretty close. No, no, this one. Hi guys, before we talk about the film, uh, let's talk about the period in which the film was made. We're talking about the Cold War, uh, 1946 to 1991. A lot of films at the time were basically warnings about communism and World War III. So you have some things that are like pro-Cold War, that are dead than red. Then you have ones that are movies worried about nuclear winter and you know, mutants attacking us if we actually did go to war. The question was really, is it worth dying for? Is it better to die on our feet than live on our knees? So you have movies like Evasion of the Body Snatchers versus The Day the Earth Stood Still. You have other ones like War of the Worlds, uh, which was really kind of a Cold War film. You know, keep watching the skies. It's better to be human and everything. Then there's Them, where fear of atomic bombs and <clears throat> World War Three made people question the whole thing about do we need this kind of nonsense? I mean, do we want to die for ideals? And that's kind of the setting for the films being made of this period. Not all the films, but a lot of the sci-fi ones. Okay, background of the film. World Without End, produced in 1957. There is a few people who say it was only made to reuse footage from flight to Mars, 1951, but that is unfair. The story is a basic B-movie story. Somehow a rocket is projected into the future by an accident, and the astronauts find at Earth with a little more radiation and a lot less people. Now the themes are actually kind of interesting, and the ending is both optimistic yet unique. So let's start with the characters. First, the astronauts. I don't know. That seems like a little bit of an overreaction to just somebody wanting to hug you. Yeah. Okay, now, there are two races on this Earth, future Earth. One of which is incredibly advanced scientifically, but they're pacifists. They've lived underground for most of the time since after World War III. And they've come to the point where really they don't want to have anything to do with the surface world. Let's take a look at them. No, I said scientifically advanced, okay? Okay, they are scientifically advanced, but they're somewhat vicious and not pacifists. There we are, that's them right there. Now the second race, or should I say second culture, since both of them are homo sapiens, did not have the benefit of being underground when whatever happened happened. I'm assuming it's World War III, but there's also suggestion of pollution and other things that happened. And they were scarred genetically. Many of them have single eyes. Now the people underground call them the beasts, but in the end they do seem to have a culture uh, a way of life, a government, a form of government. So it's not totally that they're evil and the people on the ground are good. There's just two separate societies. Let's take a look at them. No, no, they're not even intelligent. Okay, they're intelligent, but they're pacifists. There you go. Now the reason I keep on saying World War Three is because of this clip right now. 
Where are the cities, the roads, the bridges, the great works of man? What happened to them? Armageddon. The slaughter of humanity. An atomic war no one wanted, but which no one had the wisdom to avoid. Now what makes this setting kind of weird is the fact that, well, the underground people are not prospering and they're not vicious. While in most sci-fi stories or movies, the stuff you have to worry about is coming from underground. Whether it's Lovecraft or even Stephen King nowadays, it's usually the creatures coming from underground that are vicious, multiplying like crazy, and want to take over the planet. Or at least take over your house. In this one, the folks underground actually seem to be doing badly. Their population is even decreasing, which is why I'm wondering about pollution, even though it's never mentioned in the movie. While the people on the surface, they're actually increasing in their numbers, and they're pretty vicious to the point where the people underground don't want to deal with the beasts, even though they are scientifically more advanced. They just don't want to deal with war anymore. It's almost as if it's in their genes. Intermission. If you like pizza made the real Italian way with bubbly cheese, tangy seasonings, pure ingredients, you'll say our pizza is the mosta. Try some now at the refreshment center. The future of mankind is one of those things we debate about all the time. What I'm going to show you is a series of photos and talk about evolution and future of mankind. I won't get into how the science of it, which one's more likely than the other, that's a whole different video. But what's Remember that evolution is not just environmental. Sooner or later, with genetic engineering, it's going to be our input too. Okay? Now, let's remember, we are a somewhat violent race fighting over resources. So the first one's kind of obvious. The future warrior, designed to be strong and to handle nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare. Of course, not everybody will be lucky enough to be a warrior. Some will be the have-nots, just fighting to survive. And the haves, well, they'll live probably in domed, pressurized cities, using technology to expand their lifespan as much as possible. Like this guy right here, a cyborg. Now, once you've won the fight, or the battle over resources, you still have to use them. And whether it's the remains of a ruined city in which you want to salvage much of the equipment or metal, or it's just a old, I don't know, silver mine in which you want to mine. How are you going to get those resources to the factories? Isn't it going to be easier, especially after the biological revolution, to take the factories to the resources? Organic factories. Not only able to go to the resources, but to even carry extra equipment if they need to. Of course, you're going to need somebody out there to direct things, middle management. So the haves will have to have a vehicle allow them to go around that environment. And that's where the have-nots come in, as mounts. Now, of course, there's other choices. Some folks, for example, or some nations, might decide to try to move into the sea. Of course, the ocean, while largely unexplored and somewhat polluted, would still be a vast resource to exploit. Of course, there'd also be probably more than one nation doing so which means there'd probably be more than one design for sea folk as we entered the sea. Now some of the more wealthier nations will probably head out into space. Now space has its own dangers, radiation, no gravity, too much gravity if you're an accelerating ship, and of course you, if you get caught outside your ship, if there's an accident, you'd want to be able to survive it with a tough skin and probably greater lung capacity. So you'd probably have something that looks like this. As you can see, protection would be a big important point when out in space, especially eye protection. Also, sometimes you'd need to be outside the ship to repair it. So making certain subspecies like this one designed for the vacuum of space would probably be a must. Of course, some humans might not enjoy organic technology. They might trust inorganic technology which means they'll probably be transferring their intelligence 
to robots. Humanoid form, while still probably desired, would get in the way of function and durability. Some transferred intelligences might wish to go into non-humanoid forms like this one. Robots designed for the environment or designed to be more durable or powerful. And for those of you who don't believe in evolution, well, two things. Adult mammal, dairy product. Fun film facts. The Australian actor who plays the one of the American astronauts plays the English time traveler in George Powell's The Time Machine. Now for the flaws. And since, once again, this is a science fiction movie where the science is kind of, mm, it's a B movie, so I'm not going to pick on the science too much. But there's a few things I will pick on. Let's look at this first clip. Second check. All set? Right. Here we go. Now that scene looks pretty good. They're preparing for the acceleration of the rocket ship. But that only works if it's a cross section of the rocket ship. They're actually the cabin like in an airplane or a shuttle. So when they put their seats back, the gravity is going to pull all the blood to their head. And if their belts break, they're jammed in the back wall. Next clip. There seems to be plenty of oxygen out there. Well, this isn't Mars. No. If it were Mars, the atmospheric density would be one-tenth of normal. Well, there's one way to find out. Wonderful. Let's get some warm clothes on. It's cold out there. Now that seems to be a pretty good scene. They've checked the atmosphere. Before that scene, they actually do check the gravity. And after they leave the ship, they do check to see if the radiation level is safe afterwards. The thing they don't check, actually, is, well, germs. One of the astronauts' nickname is Doc. He's a medical officer. He's the one at the window. The first thing he should be thinking about is whether there's any bacteria or viruses I should be worried about. They should have really put something on. I give this movie an 8 out of 10. The story is pretty solid. Most of the science is okay. The main characters, the crew, are American, but they're not patriotic American, everybody's who's not American's evil kind of thing. The ending, like I said, is actually unique and pretty uh, satisfying. In the beginning, before we see the globe at the opening credits, they actually show an atomic bomb blast. Not a fake one, one from the air. A real one. No credits, no nothing to mess it up. They just show it. Now remember, this is a Cold War film. To the people watching that, that's probably a very realistic ending in how the Cold War is going to end. So this movie probably had a lot more emotional impact than it does for me or you. In the end, if you like science fiction with some softness, this is a B-movie. But you like a good solid plot, action, good characters, and stuff like that, you'll enjoy it. It even has explosions. Darn it, it's a saber-toothed cat. Cat, not a tiger. Hi guys, I'm stuck in a time loop right now, so why don't you just look at this fan service. I gotta figure out how to get out of it. I don't know how Doctor Who does it every week. Uh, what's this you're doing? Well, we have a plan. That is... Good morning. Did you sleep well? Yes, thank you. My, you are so much more muscular than our men.